Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the Group M podcast. I'm your host, Jared Bayman. Today, Group M's Global President of Business Intelligence, Brian Weiser, and I will take you through some of the key insights and takeaways from Chapter 4 of the latest paper authored by Brian and Group M Senior Advisor, Rob Norman, titled Media Landscapes. Thanks for joining us again, Brian. Welcome back to the show. Thanks for having me. Let's just jump right into chapter four. This one's called The Dream of the 90s is Alive, Convergence 2.0. One of the things in this chapter I found interesting came at the beginning with regard to telecom companies. Why are they so important to the media landscape? Well, historically, it was the telecom companies or what we can call telecom, which are the operators of the facilities that make it possible for content to get through to consumers. Uh, you know, in, in some countries, ownership of the, you know, the radio towers is separate from the ownership of the television stations. And so you could argue that those facilities owners are similarly different. But in countries like the United States and in many other countries around the world, um, what we call cable or satellite is just a modern iteration on a traditional uh, telecommunications network. And as time progressed, what the legacy telecom companies or the ILEX um, were able to do and are able to do is identical functionally to what uh, cable companies are able to do, where they can deliver uh, data or video, it's all just data or voice, uh, over a pipe to a consumer's home. And so these companies have such substantial investments uh, in that infrastructure, and that infrastructure doesn't get any less important over time. Which infrastructure is important changes, but um, uh, these companies have long uh, tried to avoid becoming what's called a, a dumb pipe, where uh, there's no value add to the infrastructure, and so that's forced them or caused them to uh, want to look for different ways to add value to their networks, content as we call it, is one of those ways. Absolutely. And, um, you know, content, speaking of that, uh, you know, Comcast was an organization that arguably pursued um, convergence most aggressively earliest in the late 90s and early 2000s. Um, So now you speak about convergence 2.0. How would you say this one is different from the original notion from the 90s and what role might it play in the future of advertising? Well, let's take it back even further. You know, in the 1980s, and really the the first inklings of this as a possibility existed, um, you know, when you saw uh, Liberty, um, which was uh, both an owner of um, uh, content as well as um, cable networks, um, sold itself essentially to uh, uh, to AT and T or an earlier iteration of AT and T. Um, at the same time, you had Time Warner uh, investing in uh, what became known as the full service network. Um, gradually, cable net, um, operators were owning um, uh, cable networks, but this concept of of the you know the converged world of uh, of content and uh, distribution. Um, you know, it was really uh, in vogue in the 1990s as something that would be just dominant in the future. Um, you know, it took a long time for, for all of this to play out. Um, and now we're at a point where the current iteration of AT&T uh, and Comcast are really the two, you know, best examples, you could say, globally uh, doing this. What, what's equally interesting, though, is that um, it's also not a universal strategy. Not every facilities-based owner has decided to invest heavily in content. Some who did divest it, right? So we saw, um, you know, it, it, a uh, <laughs> the iteration of Verizon uh, saying that, yeah, we could push AOL and Yahoo down a certain direction, but we're not going to. Yeah, and it's it's really, um, you know, Convergence 2.0 is going to be something really to, to watch out for. Um, another thing that I found to be really interesting um, from this chapter is, you know, you mentioned in here, uh, while more media companies are entering the video distribution business around the world, few have made meaningful investments in content packaging or production. And why do you suppose, why do you suppose that's the case? Yeah, well, that's the thing. I think some of them felt that um, uh, it's difficult to manage these uh, disparate cultures that tend to exist. Uh, And so it's maybe more interesting to understand what it is that, say, Comcast has done well 
um, or that in Canada, where we see a few other examples, uh, um, BCE or Bell and Rogers um, are two of the other examples where, where we see this at uh, some meaningful scale. Um, the cultural thing, difference is, is, I think, uh, is everything. I mean, it remains to be seen whether or not uh, AT&T will be able to manage its ownership of, uh, of the former Time Warner uh, or Warner Media business, um, as well as Comcast has. Um, certainly, it's been, you know, it's early, and so it may be premature to say it hasn't been working. But obviously, there's been a lot of disruption uh, managerially uh, and certainly culturally. Uh, that is the biggest single challenge now. For those who can manage it, uh, there is a world of synergy to be realized, um, probably. It just hasn't really been proven out yet. Yeah, and that's um, it's really good stuff um, and super intriguing, for sure. Um, well, that's all the time we've got for today. Uh, you can listen to this podcast and all other episodes at our link in the posting above. Tune in next week as Brian takes us through Chapter 5, Indifference Makes the Difference. If you have any questions on this chapter for Brian, please leave it in the comment section below, and Brian will do his best to answer you. Thanks for listening, everyone.